Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Pleasure Points Podcast. I'm your host, James Rohr. You can find me on TikTok at the Tongue Guy. You can email the show, Pleasure Points Podcast at Gmail. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. This one we're talking about uh, observing some of the programming that happens in the mind and also a lot about resilience, which I think is the most important marker for health. So without any further ado, enjoy the show. Hey, I hope your week is off to a great start. Thank you so much for being here. I'm feeling good. Happy to be here with you guys. As always, it's so nice. And if you want to be grumpy and you're having a hard time, then that's cool too. You're free to stay as grumpy as you want to be because we're free here in, in this world and you're free to be you. However that is, don't let anyone tell you you need to change. <laughs> but now change, huh? Just quit bringing the bad mood. I love you. You're perfect. Now change. Um, so here we are. It's another week. How glorious that we get to be here together. So I was uh, thinking a lot lately about resilience and fear. And uh, I was mentioned, if you listened to last week, I've been doing this DIY project in uh, in the house and remodeling a, a bathroom, which I'm completely, uh, was completely unqualified to do, but we're doing it and it's happening. We laid the floor down the other day and it was just so shocking to really approach it as a meditation in a way of like, observing meditation is probably too kind and romantic of an idea, but, uh, to really observe my thought process during the whole thing, because I was confronted with feeling completely incompetent, uh, unsure, certainly untrained and inexperienced trained because I've watched a gazillion hours on YouTube, uh, but inexperienced. And while I was participating in this whole thing, just watching the mind go to places of like, you know, maybe you shouldn't even be doing this or other people can do it better. Uh, if you screw up, it's going to be terrible. And I watch the mind and be like, well, okay, what's the worst thing that would happen if I like quote unquote screwed up and it was like laid totally wrong. Well, you know, then you have to like, you might have to redo the whole thing. That's going to cost time and money. Or if like you, when you go to sell the house, if people are upset that the floor is uneven and like all, just like all of these things that as like when you hear yourself, when I hear myself say it, it's like, oh, this is absurd. But to really like we'll just watch that those tracks run, like does that ever happen to you? You ever find yourself like just doing something kind of ordinary or maybe even new or just living your life, even having a cup of coffee, but then your mind is going to like all of these other different scenarios of what might happen. And I was watching how my mind was going to a place of, um, in some ways, it was a couple of things of like, being perhaps underachieving, which I've never liked to do. I don't think anyone likes to do it, but I definitely didn't like that. And then also um, like scarcity going immediately into like how much would it cost to fix whatever I might screw up. Time is the thing too, but more, it was more about like money. And it's just so silly how all these things, because in the beauty that I've learned about carpentry and all this stuff is that like everything can be fixed. <laughs> It's like worst case scenario, you tear it down, you start over. Uh, but usually it doesn't, it's not like that. Um, everything can be fixed. There's solutions. There's like a stopgap measures. There's cover up, there's fix it, there's sanders. There's like all of the things. But uh, that part of my brain that wants to get things perfect, it doesn't care about that. You know, it's not thinking about that. It's just like wanting to achieve excellence from right from the get go. And so as we were doing it, I was just like watching the mind race. And so as that's going, I'm still trying to do like a good job <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> and uh, we did a pretty good job. But there's this one, there's like one tile that sticks up more than it should. And I knew that that might happen because in the underfloor layment that I put down, uh, I don't know, somehow it got weird. I thought I did everything right, but some somehow things got a little weird. And uh, so there's this one tile that's like a little funky. And I've thought since then about like, do we rip it up and try to sand it down and fix it and just do it over? Uh, but now I kind of like it because that tile kind of represents all of some of this, like the fear and the doubt and all of that. Uh, and now I kind of like it as like this remember remembrance of just increasing awareness because that's what I think all this stuff is about. In some ways, this is like why I started the podcast is just like, let's start shining a light 
on of as much of the human experience as we can, especially our internal experience and especially the things that the programming that just tends to run automatically without us even paying attention to it. Because like, I don't know the, had I not been doing this work uh, that I've been, you know, working on for the last decade or two of paying attention to the, to the self and the thoughts, I may have just completely bought that whole, like, you need to be excellent. You have to do great. Uh, you can't feel good about yourself unless things are perfect. You know, and the irony is like, if you've driven to that kind of perfection, like you're, those people are never happy. <laughs> They're not, even when it's done perfect, it's like, it's never quite perfect enough. And I've never been like a perfect guy, but I have been like an excellent guy wanting things to be excellent and strive for that. Um, and then what happens is that when, when that's the initiation, when that's what's being put out into the world, when that's the drive, that's the programming that's running the ship, it's so easy for the rest of the body to follow into kind of a fight or flight mode because that programming tends to believe that it's life, it can be a matter of life or death. And I know it sounds completely insane. They're talking about like laying a tile floor as being a matter of life and death, but the programming will have us believe that if things aren't, accomplished exactly the way that they should be that somehow it will be reflected poorly on us will be perceived as being you know not so good or disapproved of uh and that the lack of approval could be something that the ego identifies as you know, being equivalent to dying uh or being a threat to survival for sure right it's like how many places in your life do you think okay if i don't get approval here then maybe you don't get into the club or you're not going to be liked. You're not going to be uh, have a happy relationship life. Your family is going to think poorly of you. You're not going to be invited to certain things. And that kind of social death is sometimes worse than even actual death. I heard that, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that uh, way back when there were certain tribes that in the worst punishment that they could dole out wasn't actually death. It was excommunication from the group or from the tribe that that feeling of being rejected, of being disapproved of, of being unwanted was so much more devastating than actually taking somebody's life that they would just excommunicate them. They would kick them out and they wouldn't let them come back. And so <laughs> like notice uh, if you want those thoughts that you might have for you of how many times are you in some way, shape or form doing the math of, am I going to be disapproved of here? Am I going to be thought of poorly if you don't have the flashy car, if you're not dressing exactly as people are dressing around you, if you don't have the nicest, the nicest boutique, if you're not, you know, excelling the way that you should, all of those things, um, like in some way, it's good to pay attention to see if there is a threat of being disapproved of. And if there is a fear of disapproval, to notice what happens in your body as you think about it, as you observe it. Does your body enter some state of fight or flight? Is your body doing some kind of calculation as to how much it might hurt, how much effort we have to put in so that it doesn't hurt us the way that, you know, we're afraid of it happening? And, you know, what might happen to tension in your neck, tension in your head, uh, any sensations in your stomach, anxiety, nervousness, you know, irritable bowel, any of those things that tend to happen when we get to be under stress. This is like, and all of this happened in the flash of an hour <laughs> as I was uh, tiling the bathroom. I mean, it's been, you know, I've observed it throughout the process. Um, and part of one of the things that I love about this life, or maybe it's just how I was raised or being the third of four kids or whatever, is that I have enough gumption to just be like, well, screw it. I'm going to do it anyway. And let's just see what happens. You know, if I'd really thought, well, one, if I had known what I was getting myself into when I started tearing out the bathroom, uh, I may not have totally done it. Uh, and if I'd really thought it through, I probably wouldn't have done it either. But that's not how we do it. I mean, that's how we got the van kind of the same way. We're like, let's just get the van. It's going to be great. We'll figure it out. And we did figure it out. It took a little while. Um, and look at all the adventures and the fun and, you know, just the joy of seeing it. But if I always let that voice run of being disapproved of, then it may have a very different outcome. And so it, I wasn't surprised that the tile like that one, and then some other ones were like a little bit off, 
in part because as I was doing it, I wasn't like laying it down from a place of joy and a place of like excitement. The majority of the energy that I had when I was laying it down was fear, <laughs> like fear of screwing it up, fear of it being bad, fear of it being terrible. And, uh, it, you know, it's rare when we are filled with fear that good things come out of it. In fact, fear is probably the number one thing that, that holds us back. And so, um, I'm just sharing this with you as sort of crazy as it sounds to be talking about this, but I know that this happens to people in all different areas of their life. I mean, it could happen to you when you're just like, maybe you're pouring a glass of coffee and you're like, Oh, I shouldn't have taken so much. Did I leave enough for my partner? Or like, gosh, I read, I shouldn't be drinking this much coffee. Like, Oh, is my doctor going to find out or what are they going to think? Or, um, you know, maybe you use the same coffee mug all the time and you think, gosh, maybe I should really mix up my coffee mugs. It's a little weird that I use the same coffee mug all the time, like all of that chatter. So part of like the freedom that we, and that I care so much about is the freedom from some of this programming. Like, what are those thoughts? What are those rhythms? What are those patterns that are going on all of the time? And paying attention to that and noticing and observing in all the things that we do. So let me know. I would love to hear from you guys. You know, uh, hit me up, Pleasure Points Podcast at Gmail. You can find me on Instagram, uh, TikTok, all the things. The TikTok doesn't really have a, they don't have a good direct message function. We both have to like follow each other. And it's like a little weird. That interface is like a little clunky. Uh, Instagram and the DMing and Instagram is so much easier than, uh, than it is on TikTok. But I'm having fun on TikTok. I crossed over 10,000 followers, which is bananas. Um, I'm now like a super micro, uh, micro, micro, micro influencer. <laughs> but it's fun. I've been posting a lot of videos on uh, acupressure points in particular, some tongue stuff as well. And, you know, the thing that I really care about is helping people to feel free, helping people to feel like with whatever comes up in their body, they have the tools and the resources to handle their stuff on their own. I love that. And, you know, the less dependent we can be on like the huge infrastructure of Western medicine, the, the questionable practices of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and to be able to listen to our bodies, to identify the programming, pay attention to our intuition, act early instead of later. Uh, and then of course, having the natural resources, whether it's essential oils, good supplementation, knowledge of acupressure in order to help regulate and exercise yoga, qigong, all that stuff to help regulate our bodies. Man, that's like that success. I don't know what the equivalent of homesteading is with our health. Maybe it's homestead health. <laughs> uh, but that that's that's the thing to go for uh, because that's it's just better that way. Instead of being locked into having to go to the doctor's office again and again and again and again. I remember when I was really sick with Crohn's disease, I, uh, it was really intense for me because I was sick, actively sick, and I was starting my acupuncture practice. So I was working and I was seeing clients and I felt like a fraud. Talk about disapproval, right? I felt like a fraud. I was like, I tried, I put so much energy into hiding being sick because I was like, if anyone finds out that I'm sick, how could they ever trust me as a practitioner? Now, of course, I know it's like, well, you're in it. You understand like different things and whatever. But at the time, you know, I was just like, me, like the most exhausting thing, thinking about being sick aside from uh, managing symptoms was, was like a lot, but it was like trying to like keep up the facade that everything was cool or I had everything together. Super moms out there know what I'm talking about. It's like trying to be all things to all people. It's exhausting. And so, um, you know, when patients would come in with, uh, with Crohn's disease and they were dealing with what I was dealing with, it was so intense for me because I was also working with the hospital system. So most of the time, the patients, if I saw them, they had already had some surgeries that had like some bowel resection and all of that. And that was just really intense. And what I saw, what I noticed from them was that once they got cut open once, it's like they would keep getting cut open. It was just like they've been through it once. So then if there's more damaged tissue, it's like, well, I'll just go back in and cut that out too and cut that out. So these people didn't just have one surgery. They had multiple surgeries. Now, I'm sure that there are people out there that have one successful surgery and then they're feeling great. So they don't necessarily need to come back. They don't need to come in and see an acupuncture. So I was seeing the people that were still sick and unwell looking for answers. And I get that. But also 
uh, I do think there's something that like once you get on a pharmaceutical, once you get into a particular system, then you're just kind of going back again and again and again and again and again. You know, it's like that pharmaceutical to cover up the other side effects, to address the side effects of the other pharmaceutical and round and round it goes. And so breaking free of that cycle is something that I am really passionate about. Now, it's not always done that way. And of course, there are people that go, they get, you know, a one-off treatment and they're fine and that's great. I've been that person before too. I get it. I'm thankful for Western medicine when that happens. But to me, there's still nothing quite like feeling empowered to know that when stuff comes up, especially the little things, the nagging things, the things that aren't necessarily life-threatening, but that are getting in the way of a nice quality of life, if we can change our relationship to that, if we can feel empowered to heal, to love on ourselves, to accept what is, to allow for the possibility of change, then well, that's like that's high-quality living right there. That's resilience, you know, being able to bounce back, being able to recover well, being able to handle when things don't go our way or when we did get disapproved of or we thought we got disapproved of and then they come back with good health or when we faced rejection and heartache and frustration and um, all of that to be able to come back and not have it affect the core of who we are. It's like that movie uh, Inside Out to not create a core memory of like a moment of disapproval, but instead create a core memory of your resilience of where did you thrive? Where did you, where were you resourceful and you were able to, to do well and to feel good? You know, it's like, how often does our mind, those, those unconscious programs that I watched when I was doing the floor recently, those unconscious programs aren't necessarily programmed for us to feel great. They're not programming to say, Hey, like, where were we resilient? Where were we kind? Where did we thrive? No, it's focused on, it's got that negative bias on where do we have to guard against being hurt? Where do we have to be on lookout for this? You know, where do we have to be trying to get our way? It's not celebrating all the times that you are kind necessarily. Sometimes like that can come up, but more often than not, it's got that negative bias. And so I think the one of the most important benchmarks for our overall health is our resilience level. So when you're thinking about yourself, if I were to ask you, how resilient are you? How good are you at coming back from frustration, from letdown, from heartache, from things not going your way. And if you say that you're resilient, like celebrate that. That's amazing. I love that. Keep reminding yourself of all the times you've been resilient. And if you think that you're low on that, I would challenge you instead to start really looking at places where you were resilient. Maybe it wasn't resilient on the scale that you wish that it was, but did you have a day where you wanted to lay in bed all day and you still got up anyway? Was there a time where you wanted to make a hard phone call or where you didn't want to make a hard phone call, but you knew you needed to and you made that hard phone call anyway? Were there places where maybe you wanted to take the easy route and you ended up choosing not to? Start focusing and stacking those little wins, those little moments of resilience. And eventually, you know, I love to write that stuff down. Create that journal, your resilience journal of all the places where you thrived, even when you didn't think you wanted to or when you didn't feel good. Um, when everything wasn't going your way, but you, you succeeded anyway, you efforted, you initiated, you accomplished something, even if it was getting out of bed, taking a shower, taking care of yourself, stacking that resilience, because I don't know what the future has in store for us, but from everything that we've seen from the bullshit from the last two years, being resilient is going to be super, super important. So stack those resilient wins. Uh, reach out to me. Let me know uh, on a scale of zero to 10, how you rate yourself, 10 being super resilient. Uh, and I will celebrate whatever number you share with me. And uh, together we will continue to go out there, be resilient, feel good, observe what the mind, the nonsense of the mind, shine a light on the programming that's happening, and then come back to kindness and joy and just bring in a good mood to yourself and to the people around you. And if we all do that, the whole world will look completely different. So I love you guys. Have a great week and we'll catch you next time.